Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Quest for Faith with Brian. And today I have back on the channel, Drew from Drew the Catholic. And Drew, welcome back to the, to the I was going to say show, but I don't have a show, channel. <laughs> hey, Brian, thanks for having me back, man. Always, <laughs> always good to chat with you. I feel yeah, like we man. have great conversations, so I'm excited. Yeah. And for, for uh, anyone that hasn't checked out Drew's channel, please do. He's got a lot of cool stuff that he's always constantly pumping out on his channel. Obviously, links will all be down below. Um, and uh, yeah, he's uh, I love your channel, man. Every time you're popping something out, I'm watching it. So <laughs> thanks, um, man. Except during Lent. I've given up technology for entertainment for Lent. And it's so tough. I have this like mad list of all these videos I see. I'm like, oh, I need to watch that. I need to watch that. I need to watch that. I keep popping up. I'm like, mm. it's I'm tough as a creator in Lent, right? Because you like you want to give it up because you know it's probably good for you, especially when you're creating stuff. But then it's also like you missed out on so much. Or like how like if you if you don't post, like I, I haven't posted as much, not even intentionally. And then it's like, oh no, I know my metrics are down. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it's it's, it's always that constant battle. Yeah. So um, but anyways, so today we're gonna be talking through I a lot of times when Catholics and Protestants are talking, Catholics are always having to kind of explain what they mean mm -hmm. with just regular language. Um, and yeah. I'd come across a video where it was some Protestant street preachers coming up to this Catholic kid. And I say kid cause he's in college and he's 20 years younger than me. So mm -hmm. probably, so I can call him a kid. Uh, <laughs> that's all my my youngest always gets mad at me he's like why do you call these guys kids they're adults i'm like dude i was graduated from college when they were born i think i can call them a kid um why does my my camera keeps coming out of focus but um anyways but it was plain, painfully obvious that they the through this conversation they were having um this catholic kid was not understanding at all what what these uh protestant guys meant and i mean i think we could start off at the at the on the catholic side of things like when when we the words that we feel like we get most uh misinterpreted mm -hmm. by um and and start there mm -hmm. um but i think there's so many different avenues there when we're talking um protestant language that it's just different because now we're looking at two different faith backgrounds technically right. And mm -hmm. now we're talking a separation of 500 years. So things have drifted even further uh, apart just with language. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like a normal human thing in a sense, right? Like if you think about the whole, like some people say soda, some people say pop, right? Some people say Coke, even if it's a Sprite, like humans just kind of do that where if we're regionally separated or culturally separated, words you know this is how latin became the romantic languages like you know latin became like french and spanish and italian it's like those regional and cultural differences and dialects and things um influence meaning right and so then it's mm -hmm. like even though a lot of the content of what we believe is is shared between protestants and catholics a lot of the language that we use probably day to day yeah we can talk past each other really easily which is it's like you almost have to learn the opposite language to have good dialogue, I think. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if you don't take the time to understand what the other side's saying, you mm -hmm. can either, you're not going to get the, the intent you want out of, out of it. And you're not right. going to, I always feel like whenever you're having these conversations, if you're getting into a faith conversation with, with a Protestant or mm -hmm. vice versa, um, you want to come at it humbly and you don't say if you're just ignoring, like you're not picking up what they're putting down. It sounds like you're completely ignoring their point and talking mm -hmm. over them. And right. I think that's, this goes in a bad situation quickly. Right. Well, yeah. And it, and it doesn't, it doesn't help. Cause then it's like, what I've found is in, you know, dialogues with Protestants, a lot of stuff is just misconceptions over language. Mm -hmm. This was kind of the point of this whole conversation, right? Is to like clear that up on both sides. But then, some of it is you start to realize how certain, I guess, um, like linchpins of Protestant ideology form people in ways and they sort of have a bend, right? And if you don't really know what they mean by words and you don't really know that bend, then you, yeah, then you're not going to have as fruitful of a dialogue. Um, it, and, and, you know, on the same, same token, yeah, if you never get beyond that surface level of like, we're saying these words, but are we, 
clarifying what we mean by them with people, then yeah, you're likely to just, you know, talk at each other. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah. and talking about the bend, I mean, depending on what Protestant background they're from, right? If they're a Calvinist mm -hmm. or a Lutheran or, uh, you know, the, well, I mean, I guess Calvin had a big influence on Anglican too, but not, mm -hmm. not as big. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it really can totally depend on how they frame their faith. Right. Um, right. And, and I think understanding that that gets difficult today. Right. Cause I think, I think a lot of people wouldn't even know that their faith backgrounds, Calvin or like, they don't know totally where it comes from. And so for us, that gets really difficult when you're like, <laughs> okay, so what, okay. So your faith alone, but you believe in predestination, mm -hmm. but like you're trying to weave that. Cause a lot of it now is just intermingled depending on, on what church you're going to and mm -hmm. what, where you grew up. Yeah. I mean, it's like, this is where it's helpful for Catholics to realize that there's not Protestantism, right? There's Protestantisms. You know, a lot of speakers mm -hmm. will kind of use that framework to make you realize that we have this broad umbrella of what they share, which is, you know, their protest of the Catholic Church and maybe a couple key doctrines or maybe a heritage from the Reformation in some sense. But I mean, you could you could get five Protestants in a room. And they might all disagree wildly or have, have different language even amongst themselves. You know, like I think of my own journey um, from sort of non-denom kind of Baptist to non-denom charismatic to Anglican. Like there was probably like 10 distinct phases of how I even talked about theology that I kind of went through yeah. just, just in that sense, you know? Um, and then, and then like all of that, it's so funny because like you could listen to a sermon as a Catholic where they're talking about the church and as a Catholic, for instance, you'd like, Oh yeah, the church. Like when we say Catholic, the church, we have Catholic a very, church. yeah, it's the Catholic church. There's a visible and invisible reality. There's a mystical component. You know, there's the, all these ways that we talk about the church, but they have a completely different ecclesiology, even if they're using the same phrase, like, Oh, you know, come on church, like the church, you know, it could just mean to them like a gathering of people. It could just yes. mean anyone who believes whatever is the bare minimum about Christianity, or it could be like a high Presbyterian view where like, uh, you know, I think like RC Sproul saying that like, you know, confessional Presbyterianism is the church and everyone else could or could not be attached to it. Right. So he would almost have like a Catholic view, but for his denomination. So, but they all, they all might say the church and yep. mean something very different about it. Right. So you almost have to clarify and say, okay, we're saying this word, but when you say it, what do you mean by it? Yeah, like even for me growing up Church of Christ, if somebody said the church, mm -hmm. they meant that congregation, mm -hmm. right? They didn't mean other churches. It was specifically right. that congregation. Um, right. Because in that faith background, there's no church hierarchy. All churches are independent. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it meant that church. And mm -hmm. then you look at some other faith and it's like, oh, well, the invisible church, right? And they mean all of Christendom. Uh, excluding mm -hmm. Catholics most of the time, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it really can mean drastically different depending mm -hmm. on how, how they were, they were taught growing up. Right. Yeah. And there's tons of things like that too. I mean, I think the classic one is like, when did you get saved? <laughs> it's like, yes. the when did you get saved, bro? <laughs> Tell me your testimony. <laughs> yes. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. And, and, Cause I mean the whole, uh, and it's and it really actually depends even on on uh again what what type of church you're going to mm -hmm. for me growing up it was not until we got baptized right? right and so and i had to make that choice it wasn't uh i wasn't infant baptized i didn't go through confirmation or anything mm -hmm. like that I, had, I think i was what was i 17 when i finally got baptized mm -hmm. um and so that is the date you know and I, which makes sense is baptism mm -hmm. but um, there's others where they do like rededication and rebaptisms, yeah, and totally. that's where the born again thing gets right. really weird. Uh, right. Even as a Protestant growing up, I thought that was weird when they would mm -hmm. do rebaptisms. I'm like, why are you doing it again? Yeah, like, that's did scandalous to anyone with a high view of baptism. Yeah, but if it's yeah. just if it's just your commitment to Christ, like, because right, that's the that's the hard part. Some denominations think that baptism is just an exterior sign of your the commitment interior. to Christ and like, yeah. And, and it's, it's not necessary. 
Right. It doesn't, it's not efficacious in any way. Like it's not doing anything. It's not, um, it's not transforming you or anything like they, they would say like the transformation has already happened and you're just proclaiming it through your baptism. So it's like, well then if you fall away and then come back, it's like, yeah, dunk yourself again, you know, why not? Right. Um, yeah, which is interesting, but I think that one's really interesting, right? Cause there's a lot of like soteriological, like, like claims just being made with like, oh yeah, I got saved back, you know, in 2010 or whatever. And, and what they're usually meaning, cause like Catholics, I feel like hear this question. And I remember coming into the church, I heard a lot of Catholic speakers be like, yeah, I remember someone asked me when I got saved and I'm like, I don't know how to answer that. And that's because what they're really asking is like, when did you start taking your faith seriously? Is like mm -hmm. kind of what that means in a sense. And there's some so soteriological baggage behind how they're saying it, but like, Catholics would say, oh, yeah, you know, I converted in. And even if they were a cradle Catholic, they'd be like, I experienced an interior conversion when I was 18 or whatever. And that's kind of the same. They're almost saying the same thing of like, here's when I started taking my faith seriously, yeah. right? But there's a different approach to some of the theological stuff. So that that can be helpful, right? Because like if, if someone comes up and says, oh, hey, are you saved? And if you're a practicing Catholic, essentially they're just trying to say, do you take your faith seriously? So you could say, yeah, I'm yes. saved. <laughs> Yeah. And then you can say, and, you know, I'm being sanctified and one day we'll, you know, attain the salvation revealed at the end of the age, like it says in first Peter. But, but yeah, like, I guess if your question is, do I take my faith seriously? Yes. But is your, if your question is, do I believe in, you know, particular reformation doctrines? Probably not. Right. And, and I remember even going uh, to a Baptist, uh, um, how am I forgetting the name? What they call them? Not Sunday school, summer. What is it? Uh, the Bible class schools they have in the summer. Um, VBS? VBS. Thank yeah, you, man. Dude. Why, how is that slipping? <laughs> I literally was talking to my wife about our VBS at our church. This <laughs> Like, we need to sign up because it fills up. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I remember the lady pulled me aside and was like, hey, you just need to say this prayer and let Jesus into your heart. And you say, <laughs> yeah. you know. And Let Jesus a, into your heart. Christ, kid, I'm like, I'll say the prayer, but that ain't what saves me, right? Like, I'm like, right. I need to be baptized. Right. Um, and luckily, I had the struggle of faith at that point that I or understood my faith enough at that point. That I was like, no, I need to get baptized still. Yeah. Um, and, and so it really can mean uh, a different between uh, Protestants and mm -hmm. understanding that's big. And I, and I would typically say if, if a Protestant comes up and asks you, are you born again? say yes like mm -hmm. especially if, if you're baptized because that's what jesus yes. is talking about so if, if you're a baptized catholic and they say are you born again be like yes sir <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah. i'm i'm baptized and confirmed yeah i'm mm -hmm. born again you mm -hmm. know and then they'll kind of go oh wait what do you mean um and and so i think i mm -hmm. I, I see that i see catholics get tripped up on that a ton mm -hmm. when they're like are you born again Right. Well, it's kind of the same question, right? Like they obviously have a lot of theological implications and they're trying to sort of imply that they, that you should be in their camp. But the, the essence of the question is still just like, are you taking Jesus seriously? Right. Which, so that's like, this is what I've, I've noticed. Like when, when I have conversations after converting with Protestants who are, you know, maybe at best skeptical to like outright flagrantly opposed to the Catholic church. The thing that surprises them the most is that I take Jesus so seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, like I remember probably six months after we converted, there was a couple uh, who lived in our area at the time and uh, they since moved, but we went out to dinner and we didn't really know them well. We had like kind of hung out in similar circles and they were really cool people. And he was a youth pastor. And I remember, you know, I had studied theology. So we were talking, he's like, Oh, where do you guys go to church? I'm like, Oh, we go to St. Mary's. And he's like, Oh, you know, did you grow up Catholic? And I'm like, no. And he's like, Oh, did you become Catholic when you married your wife? And she grew up Catholic. And I was like, no, no. we both converted last year. And he looked at me like, what? He's like, I'm, I don't hear of people becoming Catholic. I only hear about people leaving the Catholic church for like my church. And <laughs> it was kind of like he was shocked that I could play ball and talk theology mm -hmm. and took Jesus so seriously as a Catholic. Like that was, you know, so I think that that's like effective sometimes, you know, maybe, maybe you don't just come out guns blazing of like, well, when you say, are we born again? You have an improper understanding of John three and baptism. Right. You know, you just say, yeah, I take Jesus very seriously and we can talk about that. And then usually they'll be shocked. They're like, wait, you're a Catholic and you like, you sound like me in some ways, right? You sound like you care and you sound like you love Jesus. Right. Yep. And that opens a lot of doors. Cause then, then it's like, okay, well if this Catholic gets the gospel, then 
what is Catholicism? It's probably not what I understood, right? It can almost create an opportunity to, to like change someone's opinion about Catholics. Right. And I think that that's a good segue into the, the, one of the other things that popped up in that video when they were asking him if, if uh, uh, did he know, uh, well, did they say the good news or the gospels? I think he said, do you know the gospels in this video that I was like, Catholics like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Probably. Right. And yeah. he's, <laughs> and, and in him, he's like, well, <clears throat> like, I don't know it, know it. And he's thinking as like, do I, have I memorized these scriptures? Right. Right. Like how well do I yeah. know them is yeah. the way this Catholic kid was thinking. And they were asking, have you heard of, of Christ dying on the cross and right. your salvation? Right. right. And your salvation through Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what they were asking him. Not necessarily. Well, how well do you know Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? Mm -hmm. Like, and I think that totally tripped him up. And it right. was it was a really interesting uh, interaction. And I've heard that happen in other places, too, yeah. where uh, if if a Protestant's asking you, do you know the good news or do you know the gospel? They're not probably asking you, how well do you know scripture? <laughs> They're asking you. Do you know do you know who Christ is and that he yeah. died for our sins and right. and yeah it's yeah. the charisma right like it's the there the, when Protestantism talks about the gospel and you and Catholic figures do this too we just don't have it colloquially in our language as often they're they're talking about the charisma like the pronunciation of the faith right mm -hmm. which is interesting because like in a Catholic mindset that's that's definitely important we have homilies every Sunday we have we have religious orders whose entire charism is like being charismatic, right? Like preaching, you know, like I think about like the Dominicans, you know, the order of preachers, right? Um, so like we have that charism in Catholicism. Like a lot of the great saints did that, you know, St. Francis de Sales kind of out tracted the Protestant tract people. He, you know, <laughs> would hand out gospel tracts to Calvinists, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we often think of, encountering Jesus as this continual interior thing that leads to a life more in conformity with the church, which is right. Whereas Protestants, it's, it's almost like a, Oh, I want to be careful because I'm not trying to be alienating with this language. I'm just <laughs> trying to make it simple to understand. It's almost like a sales pitch, like a propositional pitch of like, yes, I'm going to say, Hey, did, you know, did you know that you're a sinner and that your sins have earned hell, but then Jesus came to die for you to pay the price. What do you think about that? And if it moves you to accept Jesus, then boom, now you're a you're Christian. Saved. You're saved. And you're born right? again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it's like, that's it. And obviously they would say like fruit comes, you know, life in the spirit comes, prayer comes from that. But like, that's, that is, that is it. Like you have that gospel preaching and then someone moves to accept it. And then like, boom, you're a Christian now, like bippity boppity boop. That's all you had to do. Right. Yeah. Whereas with Catholics, we would say, yeah, like you're being drawn to the church through that. And that is in a sense, I think the catechism talks about like where you're, life starts in Christ with that initial being drawn to the, to the charisma. Of course it starts there and yet it doesn't stop there. Like it, it, it grows beyond that in a natural way to full integration with the church, to baptism, to confirmation, to the sacraments. Right. So that's like, cause like a Catholic would be like, Oh, well if what you mean is like, have I accepted God in my life. Well, yeah, I live according to the precepts of the church. Like, of course I have. Right. And I'm continuing to be holy. We don't right. view it in a static of a way, I guess would be maybe the way to talk about that. Um, yeah, but that, that's always an interesting one. Cause yeah, the, it's like the whole, it's, it's funny. Cause in some ways for being so focused on scripture, Protestants, when they are pr like that, that movement of like just preaching the gospel, it's like you said, it's not about, do you have these scriptures really me well memorized? It's like, do you know this proposition and do you accept it? And when Catholics hear the gospels, we're thinking of scripture. So it's kind of funny because it's like the reverse of what you'd expect yeah. in a way, I guess. <laughs> Which you would think it'd be the opposite, right? Yeah, With, you right. Know? Um, yeah. And, I, and I think you, you brought up another good point too, that, I, that um, it's interesting to me listening to some Protestants talk about uh, faith alone, mm -hmm. but then they'll, I mean, okay. Some go to the extreme, right? Like mm -hmm. they go to the extreme where, okay, cool. I'm baptized or I'm born again. I don't have to worry about anything else. Mm -hmm. I can just live my life. However I want to live it. Right. Mm -hmm. like, there is that extreme out there, but I'm talking like the serious Christians that take their faith seriously. Mm -hmm. And you hear them start articulating, um, that they'll say like, you know, yeah. So after you're saved and you're born again, 
and then you fearfully work out your salvation. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, you realize we're saying the same thing. We're just using different ways to describe yeah, it, right? Like, right. It, it gets interesting when you start diving into that and you're going, so yeah, no, we, we were working out our salvation after, after we've been saved. And right. that's the works that we talk about. Um, right. And I think that that kind of gets that that gets interesting when you hear someone go, yeah, I agree with you 100 percent. Yeah, you work it out after uh, after your, your uh, you work your salvation out. So, right. Well, yeah. And so you would have like certain streams where they almost do have a, a Catholic view of like you could lose your salvation. You need to bear fruit. And it's not that you're like you're not like uh, what do I want to say here. You're cooperating with Christ in that you're not subverting or being a Pelagian where you're just earning and, and merit like meriting without Christ salvation. Right. But then, then there'd be like the Calvinist stream that would say like, well, the good works are just, you know, the natural fruit of the Christian, but they don't like, like your salvation was predestined before time. And so it's just, you're sort of uncovering what was like, I guess, stamped out in the tablet of history. And so there's a way in which you almost can't resist it. So it's, like, like the Calvinist approach would be like, well, you know, irresistible grace is like, is the I in tulip, the five points of Calvinism. And so it's mm -hmm. like, well, of course you're going to start acting better because grace is irresistible and you were elect. So, you know, whereas like a more Arminian Protestant or, you know, like I think of like a classic Methodist or Nazarene um, would say like, well, no, you can reject God and leave him. And so, yeah, then, then those things do, do matter and then like the baptist who follows that line of thinking would say yeah I'm, yeah i'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling it's yeah it's, it's an interesting blend because like there's so much historical baggage between some of this language yeah and like it's like hard for most people to like i think it's hard for them to understand each other yeah sometimes. exactly and like realize that they've been given they've been given a tradition in terms of how they speak about things and how they believe. And they would say, well, no, it's just the Bible. It's like, well, yeah, sure. But the way that you talk about it is not directly from scripture. Even if it's inspired by some of the words of scripture, there's right. like a, a construct that you've been handed, which then <laughs> that gets kind of interesting to think about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. And it's hard to decode all those. It's really hard to decode all those. Like I even have trouble Cause I studied a bunch of different denominations and stuff, but man, like the less I, the less I'm like active in doing that, it's like so easy to start forgetting some of their distinctives and stuff. So it's like you run across like a weird tiny little niche stream of Protestantism. And when you're talking to someone and you're like, Oh wait, what? <laughs> I forgot yeah. all about you guys. Oh man. Yeah. And I think for me, where what makes it even the water is even muddier is the just prominence of Bible churches. Mm -hmm. are non-denominational churches because right. it's kind of whatever what the preacher wants to mm -hmm. lead the church and that's what they kind of believe right mm -hmm. and and i feel um sometimes depending on where you're going right like i i think sometimes it's very watered down mm -hmm. and so they don't really have a firm understanding of what they mean by what they're saying right and i think right. that that gets that's a hard conversation to have when somebody doesn't quite understand what they're, why they're talking the way they're talking. Right. Well, and a lot of times like, yeah, exactly that. Like at, at churches like that, at least in my experience, cause I was a part of a lot of evangelical non-denom congregations. And there would be things that like the elder board, you know, like the board of elders. So like for people, so for Catholics listening, like you'd have your head pastor, like your preaching pastor, and then your executive pastor, who's usually kind of like just the admin guy. And then they'd have a board of elders. So think parochial council, but like they would say that that's like the authority of the church is the board yep. of elders. Right. But that structure was never really talked about in church. Like most people in the pews just had this sense that like, oh, this guy's our pastor because somehow God called him and that's all that has to happen there. You know, they didn't even realize that there's usually some sort of ordination structure in those churches. Um, some, yeah. Yeah, some of them, like they totally would have like a laying on of hands, which is just other pastors that you agree with kind of saying, you know, God's called you or whatever. And they didn't realize there'd be like, like in the congregation, most people weren't aware of the oversight of the board of elders. They didn't know that, you know, most of those congregations had bylaws and like, and like, I mean, in the same way that we have canon law, 
every evangelical congregation I was a part of had organizational bylaws of like mm-hmm. how you're allowed to operate as a pastor, you know, even completely independent ones. And so it's just kind of interesting because as much as people will harp on Catholicism for having some of those things and being so legalistic, look at all these laws you guys have. It's like, well, right. you, you kind of have to have the same things too. And most of them do, but the average parishioner until you got really involved and were like an official member of a church. You ever have churches? Did you ever go yeah. to a church that was like this? Like people could be going their whole life and not be like a member, but then there's like a membership those, yeah. drive or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Then you would learn some of that stuff, but it wasn't like this deep theology of, I mean, at least in my experience, they would like have a scripture about elders and the qualifications and like a little like bullet point list of like the role of an elder. And then boom. All right, cool. Now sign up and you're a member, you know, and then here's what we expect of members. They like tie or whatever. But Sunday to Sunday, almost none of that was fleshed out or discussed. So that's another really interesting thing is some of the on the ground business of the church is almost like a, and especially in like the evangelical mindset is almost like an, it's like a necessary afterthought. Like it, mm-hmm. you have to do these things just cause it's necessary. Cause you know, being practical, but it's not necessarily attached to the core of like the gospel or whatever. Right. right. Whereas we would almost say that like the, the composition of the church in, in a sense, there's, there is a sense in which the structure and composition of the church is necessary and there's developments upon that that maybe are not essential, but you know, are still allowed. So it's just, that's another interesting distinction. Cause like when they're talking about the church, you know, we're thinking about some of that necessary structural stuff. Like we said earlier there, maybe not, but then, like a Protestant might be talking to you about these essential components of the, of the gospel in their mind without even an awareness that their own tradition has being influenced. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And for me, so like the elders in church of Christ ran the church, right? Like, mm-hmm. so you, you, and they would hire the preacher or right? right. the congregation would kind of vote on it, but mm-hmm. they would reelect elders every four or five years. Mm-hmm. And so you could be an elder for 20 years at your church, but right. you'd go through a reelection and then they'd have these meetings reading over scripture on what an elder should be. Mm-hmm. And if uh, they were ever divorced, that disqualifies you from being an mm-hmm. elder. If your kids aren't faithful, that would disqualify you yeah. from being an elder. And they'd have all these qualifications. And I remember as a teenager going to those meetings and listening to um, everyone talking about, okay, so these are the right. qualifications we're looking for. Okay, out of the men in the congregation, uh, everyone, you know, write whoever you, you want to vote for, put their name in the hat, and then it would, mm-hmm. like, dwindle down. Um, they'd go through a number of different iterations to get right. down to that. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's funny, right? Because we have elections for the Pope. <laughs> it's like, right. At some point, it's like there's there's just so many funny things like that where there's these long standing disagreements. And then like, we've essentially started doing similar. I'm not saying that they're like one to one the same, because obviously what we believe about the Pope is very different than what they believe about elders. But like, there's just similarities that are like kind of funny when someone is so historically divorced from how all this stuff happened and like, you know, um, yeah, not really aware of it. Um, and then on the same token, like we have, we have that within Catholicism too, right? Like we probably have people in our pews who, take for granted a lot of stuff and maybe don't know where it comes from or why we do it this way or whatever, you know? Um, like I, like I've even been thinking about that. We've been doing this, uh, homily series. My priest has been doing on, uh, the mass and mm-hmm. like talking through, like when we genuflect, what are we doing? Like when we're saying these prayers, where does that come from? And it's so funny. Cause you see like, it's kind of sad, but it's funny in the sense that you see people who've been Catholic their whole lives. And like all of a sudden the light bulb comes on, they go, Oh, that's, that, that's from scripture. Oh, that's yeah. from that story in the Bible. Oh, that's, oh, it all kind of clicks, you know? Um, yeah. And, and I think, I think that's a lot of times where, uh, when a Protestant comes to a mass too, mm-hmm. that a, that you, like you just said, a lot of cradle Catholics don't get that. Yeah. Um, but definitely some of the protestants would be like why are you guys doing that that makes no sense why you're genuflecting <laughs> or like well christ right. is present there in the tabernacle yeah um you know and, and going through all that because every part of mass is scripture but yeah. then you'll have you'll hear stories from was it i think it was in in rome sweet uh rome sweet home with scott Hahn. i think his wife was like 
It was amazing. There was so much scripture in there. I had no idea, yeah. like ones that really know scripture. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I think on that one, it was a uh, um, was it the Easter visual <laughs> that he accidentally took her to? I think Not yeah. <laughs> I did that with my, my the first mass my mom ever went to was Easter vigil, and that was oh, yeah. that was she was like, "Are they all this long?" And I'm like, "No, <laughs> I'm so sorry." Like um, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, that's so true, right? Like, this is one of the things that, like, so for me as a convert who, like, a big part of it was my love for the Bible and, like, trying to understand it in its proper context, like, through the historical lens of, like, what did what did first century Jews think? Yep. What I started to realize is that the faith is not just meant to be read in a book. It's actually meant to be lived. Like, tradition is meant to be lived, you know, and, and uh, Pope Benedict talked a lot about this, Um even before he's Pope, you know, it's Cardinal Ratzinger is like writing all the time. You know, tradition is not merely this dusty thing. That's like, um, that we read about. And it's funny because Protestants and Catholics can both have that problem of viewing it that way. And when I say tradition, I mean like either textual tradition and scripture or oral tradition or the life of the church. Like we can look at it as this relic of the past that maybe we need to like recapture somehow, or it's this living thing. It's like the life of Christ actually handed on. And that's, that's Catholic ecclesiology, right? Like, but as a Protestant, it was sort of like, well, here's the scriptures and this yep. is in stasis almost. Right. So it's like, read the thing, apply what you can, and then like get the doctrine out of it. Like we're extracting doctrine yeah. to have that core proposition so that people will respond positively to it. And then they're Christian. And then we just rinse and repeat Whereas in Catholicism, it's like immerse yourself in the entirety of the tradition and not just in a way that you're like reading it and extracting doctrine, but you're actually embodying it, right? It becomes incarnational. So like we don't merely read through the scriptures over the course of three years in church, but we're actually embodying them in the liturgy the entire time. And that yeah. creates, it's very different. Like instead of just, you know, going to like, um, oh man, what was that organization that everyone went to as a kid where you're like memorizing Bible verses? That was like a big Protestant thing. Um, oh, you know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I didn't do it, but Me either. Um, at Church of Christ, we had Bible bowls where all the youth groups would uh, get together to do a competition on which youth group knew the Bible better. And so it was, uh, I don't know. That, I, that's all we uh, like. That yeah. was a Church of Christ thing. And right. uh, I totally remember. I think I wasn't going to go. And then somebody dropped out and the youth minister was like, can you please come? <laughs> I was like, all right, fine. And I barely had time to study, but I did all right. I was kind of like, oh, nice. OK, I know this stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, that's funny, though, right? Because then it's like that approach of like it's good. Like it's not bad to memorize scripture and like know all that stuff. But then it becomes almost like flashcards for a test. Yes. And that that's very different than having scripture embody your life. And where, whereas like liturgical traditions, this happens more naturally. Because you, like I've found at least that Catholics know a lot more scripture than they think. They just don't know the cross references, right? They, they just can't right. tell you the verse. But they can remember it. They can finish the sentence if you start to quote it a lot of the time. And they have this different sort of acquaintanceship with it where it's almost more lived right and that's that's another like thing in even these conversations we're talking about where like a protestant might kind of put your feet to the fire and say well bring up all these verses and like can you quote this and that and they might have it memorized but the catholic embodiment of it is almost more powerful well, and I, I would say it is more powerful in the spiritual life ultimately than just like a mere memorization of it yeah. but we get embarrassed when we just like can't out uh, right out Quote out quote people <laughs> yeah comes a quote in game and i mean and, yeah. and i always think that too though uh if you're purposely engaging protestants in your faith mm -hmm. right like no you do have to have that that wheelhouse right yeah like, you have to be able to be like well you know in first corinthians chapter 11 verse 27 when when you like you would have to go mm -hmm. and show them oh yeah this kid this guy knows no scripture mm -hmm. um and so and if you're having a deeper conversation, right? Like I think mm -hmm. the stuff we were talking about in the beginning here was more the first, the first volleys, right? Yeah. Are you born again? Uh, you yeah. know, uh, uh, working out your salvation, that type of stuff. But I think if you do start diving into it deeper, it, 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 um, 
it gives you a ton of brownie points mm -hmm. if you can quote a few verses. You yeah, know? you throw them for a loop, man. Like if you're saying like citations and then pulling things up and like reading them, it's like, oh, because the assumption is that we just don't know scripture at all, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, like for me, that was my experience growing up with Catholics that mm -hmm. I grew up with. You know, mm -hmm. like all my friends I had, my best friend was Catholic. And I say Catholic as in culturally Catholic. Because mm -hmm. I think, you know, he'd go Christmas, Easter. He went through confirmation when he was 12 or 13 and then stopped going to church after that, except for Christmas, Easter. Mm -hmm. um, and same with this other girl down the street for me. It was the same thing. And I always found it weird that I was the one explaining everything, but like when mm -hmm. we would talk about Bible stories. And But I think... Unfortunately, especially, I would say, uh, Drew, how old are you again? I can't ever remember. 29. 29. Okay. I'm, oh, wait. I'm I'm 29 next month. I, whenever my, my wife, like, she's a couple months older than me, so whenever she, it's her birthday, you just, I automatically just take switch. on that age. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> so I'm 43, right? <clears throat> and so I think definitely on my age group, um, and I don't, I don't know if it was the same for you, but for my age group, that was my experience with Catholics. And mm -hmm. that's obviously the experience with Catholics with my parents, because my mom just thinks that all Catholics don't know anything. <laughs> and I was trying to explain to her, like, no, like, if you go to mass every day, like, you actually read the entire Bible. In right. Years. Right. And she wasn't even she wasn't listening to what I was saying and coming up with a rebuttal. Um, but all she said was like, well, that's good that you're reading the Bible. I'm like, no, the Catholic church is reading the Bible, not me, you know? Um, oh man. That's so funny. Well, but, yeah, it's, I, I think that, no, I think there's some truth to that. Um, well, I think so uh, like on one hand, this is kind of what the second Vatican council was seeking to address. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and again, Cardinal Ratzinger even writes about this. There's a, there's a letter he writes, um, uh, around that time. So he, I don't think it was, you know. Um, where essentially, I forget the gist, the, the the specific quotes, but essentially the gist of the attitude of like the European church, for instance, was what they called like uh, closeted paganism. And not in that they yeah. were like apostates or whatever, but that like culturally they were baptizing their kids and going to church maybe even every Sunday, but they didn't know it. They didn't know their faith, right? And that that's not just a Catholic problem. Like uh, that was kind of universal. Too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and when you're a Protestant, you don't view it, you view it differently because you're thinking, and this, we do the same in, you know, within our parishes as Catholics, we're not necessarily aware of like, oh man, all these Catholics don't know the Bible. Well, you know, you're, you're thinking, oh man, a lot of my parishioners in our parish maybe aren't as on fire as I would like them to be. Right. And so Protestants is the same thing. They might have a lot of people in their churches that are like, oh man, I did, like a lot of our congregation maybe doesn't get it or they're not plugged into Bible studies or they're not being discipled well, but you wouldn't necessarily go, oh, therefore our entire religion is wrong and we're going to go be Catholic. Right. right. So like you wouldn't have a negative outlook on your own p congregation. If you have the same problem, you would just be trying to address it internally, which is what we do too. But I think it's like, I guess long story short, yes, yeah, there's a huge epidemic in, in like the past 150 years of people being decatechized, I guess, regardless yeah. of what tradition you'd come from. And I think that's important to understand because in terms of our like internal conversations, right? Like I remember uh, when I was Protestant, we had this conversation a lot of like, what is the problem that we're having where people just don't know the faith? Like what happened? Right. And Catholicism is having the same interior sort of insider baseball conversations and, some people will say it was the council or it wasn't the council or it was this or it was that. And it's like, I still don't know that we've all grasped how much the world has changed since like the 1700s. Yes. And like the 1800s and like, like think about the industrial revolution and the impact that had on everybody. Right. Um, and, and like, those are like widespread sociological things where the entire world was upended and then again, and then again. And now it, now it feels like the same level of like insane, upheaval of how things used to work happens every five years right like with new yeah. social uh stuff and with new technology so it's like in a way there's just like this huge pervasive uh i guess i would say like classic liberal sort of sweep over the entire west and then you think like i really try to just spell out in my mind 
we went from a society where everyone was tightening it with their families and tightening it with their communities. And, and likely whatever denomination you were was dependent on where you lived. And it was like the center of your little town. And, you know, you might, it was probably more agrarian, like almost everyone was a farmer. Yep. And so you were working with your family all day. You were working with your, uh, your neighbors all day and you all shared the faith. And so it was almost caught and it is caught more than it's taught. And then we changed to now dad leaves the house to go to a factory and mom doesn't necessarily have to work at all. Cause like, you know, now like there's time saving devices or we just live in these little nuclear families and there's no extended right. family around. So like the work of motherhood changed drastically in terms of just being sort of like bake brownies and that's, and you know, clean the house like that that was like the 1950s motherhood whereas like the 1800s motherhood was like you have to do a lot more you know a lot yeah. more proverbs 31 type stuff yeah um and all of that changed the entirety of culture to where instead of being around each other and spending time with each other now we're more isolated even from our own units right like you live in you live in a suburb and you don't necessarily know your neighbors and you all drive yeah. to some different factory to go to work and you drive to the church of your choice so like what used to just naturally pass on the faith fundamentally changed with the industrial revolution and then again with the car and then especially with the television and the radio now we don't even talk to each other we just download information that you know the programmers put in the programming right yeah like whatever the radio show is and so it's like well of course everyone like forgot the bible and forgot the faith because they weren't talking about it and they weren't living it with each other and so i think that's Hopefully that condenses all that because I think that's why it's so universal. Is like the entire society we had just kind of. I would even upheaval. say like I think the industrial revolution made it speed up. Oh, for but sure. But I really think the Enlightenment movement is what really kicked off that. A hundred percent, I agree. You know? And Absolutely. even like you start reading, like it's funny going back and and looking at uh, the founding fathers as a Catholic now, mm -hmm. and understanding where they're yeah. coming from, and it, I go. I used to love these guys. I can't stand Thomas Jefferson now. Like <laughs> what the heck is going on yeah. with Adams, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think that enlightenment movement that really kicked off this singular. Um, and, and I think it's completely in, in, in our culture now, like it's only me, like I, mm -hmm. uh, it's what I want. It's what I mm -hmm. want to do. But I think it started there. And then the industrial revolution just made that thing just go. Phoom, and fast forward to where we're at now. Yeah, and then um, how much more so the internet, right? Yeah, yeah. And the iPhone, dude. It really, like, I think the in the same way that we talk about history, a lot of times, like, pre and post printing press, mm -hmm. obviously the Industrial Revolution is the same. The, the TV and the radio is the same. The internet's definitely a huge, po like, postmark. But I think, like, specifically the smartphone is going to be, like, that hinge like a thousand yes. years from now, they'll be like, yeah, this all led up to the real turning point, which was like when all of these technologies amalgamated into one device Stupid that everyone device. had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. It, it's uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think it's, I, it's funny cause I'm hearing it all the time now, but I was saying this four or five years ago mm -hmm. that we live in a post-Christian society. Oh, dude, and you hear sure. it regularly now. But I'd started saying it. I was looking at everything going like, no, we're mm -hmm. not even Christian anymore as a society. But I think it's because I, the per, the individualistic uh, is so pervasive in Western yeah. culture now yeah. where to be a Christian, you're not an individual, right? right. Like you're as a as a husband and father, you're called to be the head of your household. You're called to be part right. of a parish life. You're called to be part of your community. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to do that anymore. Right. And I think it. And I, and I agree with you. I think Protestants are having the same issue mm -hmm. that Catholics are having. and uh, they, But they do talk about it in a different way than, mm -hmm. than Catholics are talked about uh, with that, right? Because I think I've heard other Catholics say that the biggest uh, denomination in America is former Catholics. Um, sure. You know, and but I was talking with a Lutheran friend about this as far as the Catholic Church goes in culture. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel that there's a shift happening where more and more Catholics are taking their faith seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think this is driven more by the lady than it is the priest mm -hmm. and the, and the clergy where I feel like there is a shift where people are wanting to understand their faith again. 
Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great thing to see. And I think it's only uh, making, um, I think it's making the Catholic church seem more pal palatable to Protestants. Mm -hmm. And I think it's driving more converts. Oh yeah. There's a huge movement of that. Like there's even, I mean, this is just anecdotal, but I've seen evangelical speakers and figures raise concerns over like Gen Z that's coming to faith is becoming Catholic. And like, yeah. that's like, they, they've kind of noticed that that's happening. And I think it's like, so I think, I think it's this, it's, you know, you kind of said like everyone, like we're all kind of realizing we're in a post-Christian society, but you know, like you said, I would argue that that happened in the enlightenment and we're just now waking up to it. Yep. So it's kind of funny. You have to think, what was it that, that teased us all to fall asleep for hundreds of years, like the entire West for hundreds of years just fell asleep and this is this is like this is like the garden of gethsemane right like jesus says will you stay awake and watch with me and pray with me and the disciples all fall asleep and then boom yeah. they wake up and he's being arrested it's too late right yep like they they wait they're awoken by danger at the doorstep and i've been thinking about that passage a lot as it relates to just our whole sort of western culture because it's like in a sense we're in the garden they're coming to arrest us and we only woke up now that they're trying to throw chains around us. Right. We did, we weren't awake when, you know, when, when Judas left, we weren't awake when the plot was being, you know, plotted in yeah. the dark of night. Um, and we just were sort of comfortable and asleep, assuming that the, that the culture of, you know, what's technically post Christendom would still naturally evangelize and naturally, um, propagate the faith right like if you have a culture built on the faith it just kind of naturally propagates itself but it's such a fundamental shift in the enlightenment and we've just been asleep to it for so long and now it's like so late stage liberal right like, po yeah. like they even call it like a post liberal is like the new world because it's like now it's so liberal and, and so progressed beyond even what that was that you know you have like these weird uh I don't want to say mutations of it, but like ultimate instantiations of it that you see in like the modern left and even the reaction to that on like some of the scarier parts of the right, which is mostly overblown, but there is the, the it's still there, it's right? There. It's still yeah. there. And it's like, all of that is so, I mean, yeah, we're just coming awake to it. And the reaction, the th I think the people who grew up in internet only, like the internet only world, like post internet and especially post iPhone. Like if your childhood experience, you can't remember a time before you had a personal computer in your house Yeah, that they're the generation that it's going to happen with because it's like everyone else kind of had the lingering aroma of some sort of Christian culture, no matter how diluted it already was and how gone it already was. But people in like the post tech and like world are aware that like all meaning has been stripped everything is isolationist everything is uh nihilistic and yet yep. oddly over positive right um and like everything is leading you to like transcend it's almost gnostic it's like leading you to transcend the limitations of your humanity through your phone or through yep. your, your gender ideology or whatever you know what i mean like yeah, it's all name it. yeah and they're realizing like wow and then they look back and go Oh man. And you know, now information is in the palm of your hand. So you can just do the whole deep dive in one night. And then you have this, like what was taken from us. Right. And then that leads to these, I think these conversions, um, that's a lot, a lot of stuff to process, but like, I think that is going to be sort of, I think there's going to be like a, a counter reaction to that. Right. And then we might see it. And in some ways we already are. I think there's going to be a day when, like right now we're all going, man, this is so crazy. Look at secularism. And there might be a day when we kind of have to rein in the reaction to it a little bit, you know? I, yeah, I, I see that on the, I, it worries me. Um, like I've always grown up pretty on the right conservative, but mm -hmm. the stuff I'm seeing and hearing, I'm going, eh, y'all are getting yeah. a little, you're talking crazy now. Let's, let's right. settle down. I think we are going to have to rein in the others, but right. I, I think you're, you're right. Even on the, the whole generational technology thing because um for me like i mean the internet wasn't even a thing till i was 14 mm -hmm. like that's when aol came out you know and oh, everyone man. was in chat AOL, rooms dude, yeah. and, <laughs> and i remember as one of my sister's soccer tournaments my dad had a laptop for work and we downloaded aol on it and we're like 
let's go in a chat room. And I, we're all in there messing around with it. But, mm -hmm. um, but you're right. Like there's this residual and I even felt that in Texas. Right. So mm -hmm. I grew up in California, which was very secular, right? Mm -hmm. Like I was one of the very few kids that went to church every Sunday uh, out mm -hmm. of all my big friend group in, in high school. Um, but then I moved to Texas and I moved there in 2000 mm -hmm. and I would say up until 2007, 2008, pretty much everybody still went to church. Like you mm -hmm. could say, Oh, where do you go to church? You know, yeah, and by just like common small talk. Yeah. Yeah. And by 2015, that conversation was gone. Yeah. Right? It's like, rapid. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it happened really fast and that was actually kind of part of the reason I was like, I want to go back to where it's a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, not as secular when we moved to South Carolina, but, um, mm -hmm. but you're seeing that shift. And I think it's, it's important to remember for us as Catholics that that's happening and it's mm -hmm. not just happening to us. It's yeah, happening absolutely. to Protestants too. And There's... you'll, you'll run into a ton of Protestants that really actually don't understand that this is, that this is happening to them. Right. And they're so ingrained in our culture now that they don't understand their faith. They're understanding it through the prism of the enlightenment and mm -hmm. this individualistic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where you get those crazy theologies on the Protestant <laughs> side where you're like, yeah, dude. Okay. You're taking Calvin oh. to the extreme. Like what is happening yep. here? Or Luther to the, to the extreme. Um, or, yeah. You even get some weird, like distinctly American flavors of theology that get kind of funky. Yeah. Like the whole, um, you know, your faith isn't good enough and that's why you're not being healed or that's why you're mm -hmm. not making money and mm -hmm. like the prosperity gospel stuff. Yeah. You know, like that came out yep. of the Puritans mm -hmm. um, originally. So, um, yeah, I think it, it's important to remember that, uh, mm -hmm. that they're experiencing that too. And I think as Catholics, if we're serious about our faith and we're serious about growing, growing Christ's kingdom, and the church, it's it's good to understand that and then start learning more about our Protestant brothers and sisters right. to be able to help them. Well, yeah, and I think what's, what's interesting about that is, uh, so before I converted, this is funny, I actually had just found this this morning before we were before we were recording. I had a podcast called The Daniel Generation. Never got that big, It just and I stopped doing it after like six months because I kind of determined like, hey, I'm going to become Catholic or Orthodox. I should put a pause on this before I make everyone mad. And, <laughs> I think uh, I remember you mentioning that on your first video when I first found your channel. Oh, like, yeah. You yeah. said that like, well, we did the Dan, you know, the, the whatever. And yeah. so this is a kind of a different one now. But Right. And, and so, but it was about all of this type of stuff. And, and what really sparked all of those thoughts, and it's kind of like one of my key focus areas, I guess, in a way. It's like I talk about this stuff a lot. But there was a pastor I was really following at the time named John Mark Comer, and he was buddies with a pastor named Mark Sayers, who was an evangelical out of Australia. And this guy really, really spelled out modernism in like a huge way. And they weren't – like I appreciate these guys because they both live in very cosmopolitan cities. Like John Mark Comer lives in Portland, right? Oh, and so yeah. we're talking about someone that's a pretty faithful evangelical living in the heart of Portland. And like, he likes, you know, he, he likes his coffee and he likes all the food. Like he likes living in Portland, but he's definitely like, like a faithful evangelical. He's not some weird woke pastor. And they, they had this podcast, um, all about modernism and spelling out specifically like post Christian Western countries in the sense that uh, the whole evangelical format doesn't work there. And that's why their churches are hollowing out. Right. And cause mm -hmm. like essentially, and like we can learn from this as Catholics too. this, he had a book called the disappearing church written by Mark Sayers. It's really like, it would be good for Catholics to read this book too. As an evangelical, it was kind of the death knell of evangelicalism. I read it and I'm like, dang, we can't even like, this doesn't even work. Um, but essentially the whole premise is what evangelicalism is, is essentially the tent revival format of a service put in a nicer building. Yep. And and the, the goal is make it palatable and exciting to draw people in to faith with Jesus, which is, a, is a, another way of saying like make it relevant somehow, right? Like yep. relate to them. And this is sort of like a missionary tool of like, you know, and you can think of this even in a Catholic context, like when, um, when they were like when Jesuits are bringing the gospel to like Asia, they don't just copy paste the exact Western format. They learn the culture of the people they're evangelizing and try to contextualize the proclamation of the faith in that context. 
and we yep. baptize what we can and we get, do away with what we can't. And that's the challenge of being a missionary. And Mark Sayers, whole thesis is that that works. Like you can contextualize the gospel. Cause you know, it, as a Protestant, you do this to the extreme. Like there yep. isn't even an essential component of your liturgy. Like they can contextualize any part of a service and any part of how the faith is lived. Cause like they don't have those rigid structures. Other denominations have some of them, but like most evangelicals don't. And so there's, there's this idea that's like all evangelical churches are trying to do that same thing in the secular West. And so like, let's contextualize the gospel to this culture. So we'll have really good music and we'll have exciting yeah. sermons and we'll dress like, really nice shows. And yeah. We'll wear ripped jeans. And <clears throat> exactly. And this is the we'll seeker sensitive movement, right? So like yeah. this was, uh, Oh, what's that big church? Uh, um, it's like in a, Houston. Uh, no, that Joel, not Joel. It's from, Joel. Um, man, it's Chuck. What's his name? Um, starts with the w the church the church starts with the w um oh, i can't remember it now but he kind of started the seeker sensitive movement which like all these churches are based off of and what mark sayer started to realize like reading philosophy and just seeing how this doesn't work anymore like these churches are hollowing out and the people that they are bringing like aren't getting deep with the gospel they're only getting to the surface level and then yep. leave when it's inconvenient and then something like covid happens and then oh well now i don't need to be at church so this isn't essential and they just go all together but his, his whole thesis is that when you try to contextualize the gospel to a culture that's never had it, you can win the culture and baptize the culture and turn it into a, bop, a, a, a gospel culture. And that, so he says that's a first culture, a people group that's never had the gospel. And missionary activity there is, is contextualizing and baptizing the culture and bringing it into a gospel culture. But our culture is on the other side of that. Yep. We were a gospel culture. And then we've deconstructed it. So we want the kingdom without the king. Like we want all of the social parameters of Christendom, but we don't want the underlying values. We don't want the rigidity. We don't want the dogma. We just want social justice, whatever that means. And we just want equity and human dignity, whatever that means. Yep. But we've divorced it from the underlying reality, the logos, right? The under, that, yeah, the underlying yeah. principles that <clears throat> created that environment. Right. And so then he says, if you try to contextualize the gospel to a culture that's built off of deconstructing the gospel, you don't win the culture, you lose the gospel. Yes. And that's like, that hit so hard because I realized, oh, it really was a, a sell for liturgy because it's the whole, the, the method of communication is the message. Well, if our method of communication is, hey, you can look just like this insanely selfish consumeristic culture and still be a Christian. Well, it's actually, no, you're actually losing yeah. Christianity, right? And but so, most people are yeah. going to say, oh, that sounds great, you know? Right. And like, it doesn't yeah, require let me go anything of you. Doesn't let me go you rock out and eat some donuts and hang out uh, yeah. and hear a, a sermon that's uplifting on Sunday. And then there we go. I'm good. Right. And this is like, this is why liturgical traditions are seeing sort of a, they're trending, right? We're trending on Twitter as Catholics because we, this structure doesn't change with trends. Like we're not contextualizing yeah. the liturgy to trends. At least we shouldn't be right. <laughs> right. Should, like we're no clown masses those. guys. Come on. Yes. Um, and yeah. in, in it's considered an abuse actually when you, when you do some of those things. And so it's like, and I mean, there's a sense in which we do, right? Like even Vatican II talks about, like there's a sense in which you can have like, like obviously in certain cultures, they have certain like musical traditions that are different and that's fine to have in a liturgy or like um, the, the, like the, the decorations might be a little different, you know, um, mm -hmm. like in Europe, all the paintings of Jesus, he looks pretty white. And then you go to other places and he looks pretty Middle Eastern or maybe even or like really Asian dark. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, like the essential components stay the same. And I, that's like hmm. the the thing that's hard about that though is you can't merely just put those you can't merely just dial back the time machine and say okay well you know let's just make this look like it did in the 1700s and then that'll fix it you actually have to have that interior conversion met with a structure that can accommodate it instead yeah. of instead of contextualize instead of like losing the gospel to secularism you have to bring people to an interior conversion and then have them met with a strong tradition. Right. Right. You can't do it the reverse, you know, like, and I've been thinking about this cause like there's, 
oh, I gotta, I gotta be careful here because I'm not trying to like scandalize people or like inflagrate an entire community of Catholics. There's a sense in which I get from talking to some some friends of mine even that we feel as though if we just like build the altar rail, then everyone will convert, right? Yeah. And like I, Lex Randi, Lex Credendi, like that will for people who are already coming seriously, it will deepen just naturally their appreciation for the Eucharist. I agree with that a hundred percent. And yet for the people that like don't have that commitment already, it won't mean anything. So right. you, you know what I mean? Like you have to, this is the challenge is you have to evangelist, like be um, evangelistic enough to convert someone on the interior so that they can appreciate all those things. But we can't do it in the way that I just described where you meet them where they're at without asking anything of them um, and, and contextualize the gospel to such a degree that you lose it. That's a hard thing to navigate. And I think Catholics and Protestants are going through it together. Um, well, and, and I think yeah. what, what, like you were talking about Gen Z earlier and mm -hmm. no one's asking anything of them, you right. know, like you <laughs> listen yeah. to them. No one's like, no, one, like at work, people, companies are bending over backward to accommodate them because they have uh, time blindness or, mm -hmm. you know, what our time our, blindness, right? Have you heard that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it just, just drives week. me nuts. I'm like, no, you <laughs> lost track of time. I'm sorry. Right. Like, time blindness dude like, so you got funny. way more going on if you technically have that like my, mm -hmm. my oldest son kind of has that but he's autistic mm -hmm. so sure you know like there's <laughs> there's more to it right but um no one's ever asked anything of them mm -hmm. and to <clears throat> present the gospel where they have that interior change and then asking them to do something that's difficult yeah is super appealing absolutely it's super appealing to be like, no, you need to be better. Right. You, and, and I think that's where we're like, why we're seeing this up crop of that alpha male junk that just goes. Yeah. Like and what drives me nuts about that stuff is like, there's a lot of truth in what those create the, what those dudes say, mm -hmm. but they take it from a completely selfish standpoint. Right. And it's because people actually want to be challenged. Mm -hmm. They don't want to go through life and just, uh, they're dep like, that's why de people get so depressed when they're not living for anything. Because right. they're not challenged or asked to do something hard. So I think as Catholics, when we're talking to anybody, mm -hmm. it's like figure out how to have them have this interior conversion because it's only Christ can do that. You can just present mm -hmm. the information and Christ has to move in them. Um, right. But then it's like, okay, cool. So this is what you got to do now. Like, let's, let, right. we're going to go to Mass. This is what we do. This is how we do this because we have, we're going to, we're going to be called to do things that are uncomfortable because. Mm -hmm following Christ is not supposed to be easy. Yeah. And that, that, that is interesting. Cause like that whole mentality that I was just talking about of like, let's be relevant to the culture has attempted to make it easy. Right. That's how we talk about like, Oh, say this prayer and you're saved. Right. Yep. It's attempted to make it as easy as possible. And then on the Catholic side, like, <laughs> man, I'm just gonna make everyone mad. I think about the Knights of Columbus. <clears throat> yeah. So when I joined the Knights of Columbus, I went right to the third degree with like one exemplification and then they're trying to get me to be fourth degree. Now I'm not going to do it. I don't have time, but the same thing. They're like, Oh, we can even do an online exemplification for the fourth degree. Cause they're like trying to make it easy thinking that if we take the obstacles away, then more people will join. And I'm like, actually, I think you'd have more of the young men in our church signing up if it was really hard to be a third degree night <clears throat> because then it means something. Right. And like, that's yeah. what the younger generation is realizing. And like, yeah. And I think that's the key is that it needs to be high challenge, but not at the expense of, of grace. And that's, yes, that's the, that's the trick is like, um, calling someone, you know, it's funny. Like, this is why Jordan Peterson is so popular calling someone to clean their room and like confront their demons. Right. Like that's like really popular right now. And yet at the same time, there's like this encounter with, the reality of like facing your life and facing yourself, counting the cost of, and, and even your own mortality, which you don't reflect on at all in the secular culture. And like using those touch points as, as an entry point for people to encounter Christ of like, well, yeah, you know, you we we all are going to die. We all are responsible for our actions and, and giving them, uh, what am I trying to say? Making life matter again. Yes. And, and giving them a central narrative with which all of that makes sense and holds. Right. And like, that's because everything's been so deconstructed that like, that's 
what we're seeing with with the younger generation is it's like there's this vat of meaning you know um, yeah well and, and i even think <clears throat> about it with like marriage and family right mm -hmm. like i am so grateful that i got married when i was 25 right mm -hmm. i'm so grateful that i have kids mm -hmm. and i was saying this to my uh i was saying this to my coworkers the other day and i never did anything meaningful in my life until i got married hmm Hmm. Right. Because then mm -hmm. I, the, I had to sacrifice and I had to do things hard to provide for my family and to raise my kids and to do things differently. Like I, it put meaning in my life mm -hmm. and made my faith that much more important. Uh, I mean, that took me a minute to get there, mm -hmm. but you realize as a man, it's like, no, I'm going to make this hard decision to become Catholic, even mm -hmm. though I'm going to lose a lot because I need to make this hard decision to for my family and for my kids because my life has meaning and this is my right, meaning. Right. And, and I think you have to provide that challenge and meaning to everybody, not just yeah. men. I think women too need that, um, mm -hmm. to, to then fully live the gospel. And I, and I mm -hmm. love that's, that's what the Catholic church is calling us to do. Mm -hmm. I just think that we've gotten several generations where they haven't heard that call. Right. And we're getting we're getting there like you look at seminary like who was it i was talking i was listening to somebody the other day um and our parish is producing a few seminarians i think we have three nice. right now and it's awesome and mm -hmm. but it's a focus of my of our priests like mm -hmm. he's he's wanting he's, he's like he said his goal is to have every year to get to the point where every year he's uh he's hosting a first uh a first mass for for a new priest from from the parish every year nice. like, i want to get to that point where i'm just producing seminarians left and right but right. um almost lost my thought there um dang it i lost my thought why did i sidetrack um what talking, was I generations haven't heard that call that's kind yes, of what you're talking about yeah they haven't heard that call but right. they're starting to yeah because if you're going to be a seminarian now like you've uh -huh. grown up under the sex scandal. Mm -hmm. You've grown up hearing how crappy the Catholic church is. Mm -hmm. Like you really have to want to be a priest <laughs> yeah. to be a seminarian now. Yep. It's not something that's just, you know, Oh, well, I don't know what else I'm going to do. I don't mm -hmm. really have any options to get married. I guess I'll be a seminarian. Yeah. Like you, the, so I think, I think there's a lot of hope coming down the pipe uh, for, sure. for the Catholic church because the, the young men that are joining the seminaries now, like they're joining it with so much baggage and they're mm. willing to hold that baggage mm -hmm. and still do that. I yeah. think it's just, it, it, I think it should give us hope as laity for the future of the Catholic church. Oh, I a hundred percent agree. And you know what it is? Like, I think where we're headed in terms of like the cultural landscape is we're, we're back at the start. Of, of everything with the church in a way. And what I mean by that is like the church was born in Rome or not like literally born, but like it was born in the Roman empire. Right. Very hostile. Right. Very like that culture was abominable, you know, like classic Roman culture, like around the time that Christ came, a lot yep. of bad stuff going on. A lot of like, if you read the fathers, I mean, it's just scathing, man. Like they're abandoning children. There's all sorts of sexual promiscuity, some weird stuff with gender going on. Like it's really yeah. becoming very similar and at the same time, we're re-entering that space, not on the heels of never having had Christianity, but on the heels of Christianity having risen and then declined. And now we're entering a space that it's almost as if it had never happened. And so like the future of the church, we're having, like, I think it's going to be that. It's going to be the priests who have the negative connotations of what Christianity is believed to be even if it's not that, or even if, you know, that's just bad actors have portrayed it badly, like with the scandals and stuff. And then at the same time, we're going to have to begin again and like re-evangelize the world, right? Like this is the call for a new evangelization that it's, it's, it's the space of having to start over. And so what developed and what we would have experienced in like the 1200s or 1300s is important to remember and important to have all that beauty in our heritage. I'm not trying to say like, forget it, but with the people outside of the church, like the people on the cusp, it's as if we have to start over and like evangelize 
from the very beginning. Like we're not bringing them into a robust culture and a, and a culture of faith that just naturally propagates itself. We're literally yeah. starting with the central foundation stone that's always been there. That's the church and having to build everything around it again. And like, that's going to be what those priests do. That's what, that's what we're going to have to do. Like as content creators, and as Catholics. Yeah. I think that's what that's, I mean, <clears throat> I know that's the goal of your channel. I mean, that's mm -hmm. my goal too, is to, yeah. to, to do that. And I think it's really important for us to study the first century church mm -hmm. because they, they spread the, the spread of Christianity spread because of relationships and mm -hmm. they saw how people act so different mm -hmm. than the culture. Mm -hmm. That's what spread Christianity. It wasn't yeah. wars. It wasn't battles. It was person to person. Wow. Dude, you mm -hmm. used to be a drunkard and slept around all the time. And now you're mm -hmm. going to mass every day and you're mm -hmm. doing this thing called confetti. Like, what is going on with you, man? That's different. Mm -hmm. And it, it has to be we as as Catholics need to show our faith. Mm -hmm. And I think that is uh, and that's how the first century grew. It really wasn't right. anything other than that. And I mean, obviously we had the great apostles and, and, <laughs> and it saints helps. in the first day. Yeah, it helps. They <laughs> helped. But I think we'll get more saints because of the, right. the of the trying times that we're in. Mm -hmm. But I think as as just your normal Joe Schmo that's a Catholic looked for that first century, look what they did. Yeah. And go, okay, that's how I have to live. I need to emulate my life like that and be okay to be ridiculed, be okay mm -hmm. to be put to the put to death. Mm -hmm. Um and and, and cause I, I mean I even heard a story. Oh, mm -hmm. Gosh, this was a few months ago, but a priest was talking about a Roman executioner, mm -hmm. and uh a guard was watching these Christians be burned alive or eaten by lions or whatever, and they were singing hymns and praising God while it was happening. <laughs> It's so hardcore, dude. It's so and metal. He went, <laughs> and he literally threw his spear down and said, I'm going to be a Christian now. You might as well kill me with them. Yeah. And died there. And and, and they said, okay, cool. <laughs> and yeah, dude. That's, that's so appealing, of, though. That's like what right. people want is something that's so meaningful that you would die for it without a question. Yeah. Because you and, love it that much. And yeah. for me growing up, it's like, that's why I liked war movies. That's why I like yeah. playing army because it was the mm -hmm. sacrifice I was making. Mm -hmm. Let's let's live that and have that sacrifice for Christ. Right. And it changes the world yeah. way more than anything mm -hmm. else we can say. But living our faith and and being honest that we're struggling. We have mm -hmm. our we fall, but that we have this grace of God that constantly is calling us back to him and we just have to answer the call mm -hmm. um and i think that it'll it i think that really will grow grow the church and it will help your conversations with protestants mm -hmm. if they see that well they'll be attracted to it because they'll realize like oh these these things that like i that they might think are excessive developments aren't a hindrance but they're actually like a structure that supports continual encounter with christ right and is like in a real way, like where it's all meant to happen. It's like designed to make that really efficient. Um, that sounds like that, that sounds like a very cold way to look at it. But what I mean is like there, it's no mistake that the church is the way it is in terms of how, how we believe and how we exercise the faith, how liturgy works and how the sacraments work. Like they're designed to make a human who encounters Jesus fully alive in Christ. Right. Yes. And like, I, I think about this a lot. Like if you see this happens when anyone has any sort of conversion experience, you know, like I think about people I know that maybe were far off from the church and then it wasn't at first, at least it's almost never some intellectual argument. It's some encounter with, with Jesus. Like, it, and that sounds so mystical, but like, I really mean it like is. some people get hit like a wall where they realize, Oh, this is real. Um, and then the floodgates open and everything else starts to come in. The knowledge of the church, a desire to know history, a desire to know, you know, the rules, right. And to follow them, all of that comes from encountering Jesus first. And so it's like, especially when you have the sacraments, all of them, not just like two of them, right. Like right. one of them or, or whatever, one. when you have yeah. all of them, that is like, it's that, that, that initial encounter is like pouring gasoline 
and then it just is constantly being lit by matches. Like someone who it's just, and you can, it, it ever deepens. Right. And so that's the beauty of being a Catholic that I experienced in a way I never did as a Protestant. Like I'd have my camp highs and lows and stuff, Yep. but now it just feels like this And there's like moments of dryness or whatever, but it's never a step backwards. Like it used to be. It feels like it's just, I've, I've caught flame in this way after confirmation. And it's just a constant yeah. burn. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Like, you know, exactly. we all fall and we all like, we're, I'm dragging my whole family to confession uh, this afternoon. There you go. You know, and, but it's a constant burn now in me. Like mm-hmm. I, I never, it's never been this consistent, right? Mm-hmm. Like I feel uh, in my early twenties, like I remember leading a Bible study with a coworker at, at work on our lunch break. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I would, we would I'd join a prayer group or whatever at work. And it was kind of off the books because, you know, secularism and all that stuff. But mm-hmm. um, but that only lasted a little bit. Right. Mm-hmm. And then it was kind of felt like it was a fad. Right. And mm-hmm. then I kind of moved on and I had a big drought. Mm-hmm. But this is that was this has been constant. And it is just this. If you're faithful to your to the church and you're using the sacraments Mm -hmm. and you're taking them seriously, it is a constant burn Mm -hmm. and it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we'll, yeah, we'll see a lot more of it too. I, I, it excites me just to see like so many, cause I feel like around the time you and I probably started creating content, like a similar time. Mm -hmm. And it feels like there's an explosion of Catholic content creators, right? Like, yeah, I feel like when I was on the path to converting, there was more than there had been before then. Cause I was encountering people and it was like some of the early people. Right. Yeah. And that, then it's just like, so that there's something happening. I can't quite put my finger on, on what it might be yet, but I think it's, it's interesting. Like we're having this conversation because what it seems to me is like as a counterbalance to the world going crazy, Christians are almost going to be forced to unite just practically, but in a deeper way, like it seems like that's, I mean, and it's obvious, like, it's, I shouldn't say it seems like, it's obvious that God would want this. It seems like we're seeing a movement towards unity and not mm-hmm. some like kumbaya, soft ecumenism, but like people actually wanting the whole thing back, which would be reintegrating with the church, right? And I think that that's, I might be too optimistic, but it feels like that's inevitable in some ways and maybe not perfectly yeah. and wholly, but like, I think that like we're really there and can have those just those that that draw for protestants and then it like man if we could get everyone back in the same roof again it'd be oh, unstoppable man. yeah and you know i always talk i've talked about this number before but uh, we were mentioning the founding fathers earlier but i think statistically it was five percent of the u.s population fought in the american revolution and oh, wow. 20 percent total including that five percent supported the revolution Everybody else sat out to see what was happening, right? And Sounds about right. <laughs> look what happened, right? Yeah. And so if we can get 5% of Catholics mm-hmm. living their faith and showing that burn inside them, mm. and then 10 to 15%, maybe not outright doing it, but supporting Catholics, mm-hmm. what, what, what amazing things can happen? I mean, mm-hmm. geez, look at the twelve. 12 dudes. I just finished doing the Jeff Caven's Bible study on, uh, on acts, mm-hmm. which is phenomenal. If you haven't listened hmm. to it on the Ascension app, totally do it. Like that guy's crazy. But, um, but you, you look at what they did. Mm-hmm. It was insane. Like you really just sit there and think about acts mm-hmm. and what they did and, and the spread of Christianity when the persecution started from, from Saul now Paul, um, that was the kickoff of the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles. And it was literally Christians going, Oh, I can't be in Jerusalem anymore. I'm leaving. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm going to go talk to these dudes about mm-hmm. Christ. Like, that's what we need to do again. It's still back to the first century. And they were so reckless for them, their own safety, dude. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there was, there was no, like, how do we do this diligently? It was just with reckless abandon. Yes. But you know what drives that? I I, th- I think about this a lot. It's intense love. Like like I um I like a, uh, about a year ago I was just kind of uh I've been trying to do more like Ignatian type prayer where I'm like really, you know, contemplating and, and like meditating and 
Um, I hesitate to say I heard God speak because that language is really loaded. But there's like there's times I think we're all praying where like you get this impression upon you and you're like, whoa. Yeah. And then it really plays out well. And so like about a year ago, I was just, you know, praying and um, and just like really like trying to let my own like needs and thoughts like empty so that, you know, just God could be filling me with whatever I needed to and, you know, meditating on some scriptures. Um, I've been stuck in the gospel of Mark for like two years. There's just like a lot that God's doing with that. And I got this sense that, and I think this plays out. So I'll be curious to hear your thoughts on it, that, um, one of the key things to remember for us as we're all like going forward in this is that, you know, in terms of this fight, cause we all talk about it as a fight. There's like a crisis going on in the church. There's definitely one going on in the world. There's a huge fight in front of us, which is a call to battle, which is like yeah. what we want. And it's important to remember that the the best fighters fight for the sake of what they love rather than fight out of fear of their enemy, right? Like yes. if you're just fighting your enemy because you're afraid of what he's going to do to you, as soon as you feel like you're losing, you're going to run. But yeah. if you're fighting for the sake of what you love, you will, you'll die on that battlefield, right? And that's what the first century is, right? And that's what we're, I think, getting back to in the church is people who so intensely love Jesus Christ that they they can't help but throw themselves at all sorts of insanity for his sake and for the sake of the people they know need him, right? And if you have that like intense love, and that's not that's not this like wishy-washy like Jesus loves you, you know, like yeah. he likes you a lot. It's like <laughs> this like it's that's like the chivalrous type of love that's like I will fight and die for you. Like I I will throw myself into harm's way. Like that's the love of a father, right? You know, like yeah. you and I can say this very well. There is a lot of stuff I would blow up for the sake of my daughter, right? Yeah. <laughs> or vice versa. I would jump in front of a thousand bullets for her. And that that's not this like squishy, soft love. Like that's that is like brutal and powerful, right? And to have that, it it's almost like you wouldn't be able to help it, right? And so like that's the that's the real core of it all is like we need to get people to a place where they so desperately love Jesus that they throw themselves into the world with reckless abandon for the sake of the other people on mission. Right. Like, yeah. I don't know how you spark that in people necessarily. Like sometimes it's just conversations like this. And it's like we were saying, just encounters with people and, and, and just being involved in their lives. But like to get from the level of like, I really like Jesus and I like take my faith seriously to like, yeah, I'll go into that room and talk to that person who might kill me. And I don't care because they need to hear this. That's a jump, dude. I'm not there yet, but <laughs> yeah, no. And, that, that's something that's always troubled me when you hear about martyrs, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the when I was reading, uh, what, is that in Second Maccabees about the the seven brothers that are executed in front of the mother? Mm -hmm. Oh There's yeah, um, I can't I, remember. Anyways, I, yeah, it, but basically, uh, the uh, the Greek general starts executing her sons in front of her and all the sons mm -hmm. are encouraging the others uh, while they're being executed. And do I have that? Is my faith strong enough mm -hmm. that I could sit in that position mm -hmm. knowing what's about to happen to my family and mm -hmm. encouraging them mm -hmm. to stay strong with their faith Yeah, during that? And then for me to be like, yeah, sure, go ahead and do whatever you want to do. I'm not giving up on Christ. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's what I, I desire. And I, I agree with you. I don't know if I'm there. And mm -hmm. Lord willing, I will never be put in that situation where I have to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to prepare ourselves to be okay with that situation. Right. Right. Like I, don't, I think right now in America, we're not there. Now, if no. we were in Africa or yeah, the Middle East, there. Yeah, you have to be there. Yeah. And so we're blessed that where we live. But I think we all have to be thinking about that in the back of our heads. It's like, man, could I be a martyr? Right. Well, and I think there's 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 even a sense in which that needs to be <clears throat> not just for the penultimate situation of like gun to your head, do you deny the faith. But what about like the daily discomfort of being a, being a Catholic in America? Like like and, and so in some ways that's becoming apparent on the surface of like if you just say what the catholic church teaches on abortion cnn is certainly not going to treat you very well and the fbi might not either but yeah. in a in another way yeah right exactly you know? yeah i have like one episode where i like interviewed 
someone from a pro-life center and that episode is shadow banned. I already know. But yep. in an even deeper sense, like there are things that are normal to American life that as Catholics, we just can't have a part of. And there's like a boldness and almost like a living martyrdom in the sense of like to, to just like not participate in those things or to call them out when we see them. Um, and, and, and then even beyond that, like the cultural expectations to, to be a martyr in the sense of like abandoning those, you know, like, uh, there's a lot of cultural expectations in terms of, well, now these days it's like, it's like, if you get married, it's a selfish endeavor. And like, if you have children have one, you know, whatever. Right. And like, there's a, there's almost like a social martyrdom of like, yeah, I got married young and I'm having a whole slew of kids. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and there's like a daily martyrdom in that. And like our whole culture is designed against that. And even financially, that's like really difficult in today's world. Right. So that's the, that's the other cross, I guess you could say is like, we might not be, you know, being beheaded at the same time. Like the, the faith is always going to be opposed to the excesses of a, of a, of an evil world and like to, to live daily in opposition to those. Yeah. That's the call too. That's, and that's sometimes that's hard. Right. Cause like, like I've been thinking a lot, like what would that mean about my technology habits and like how I talk online? Like there's a sense in which being a Catholic should, I should do that differently than like people who aren't Catholic. Yeah. Right. Do I do that? No, man. I send some of the spiciest memes that are just, which I think there's well, a virtue in that. Too, you know, but. and I agree. Like it's interesting fighting back on the culture and I know yeah. we're coming up on an hour and a half and I know that's, uh, we got to uh, wrap it up here in a minute. Sure, but, sure. Um, the, uh, but I've noticed that since my conversion, I'll watch old movies that I used to love and I'm watching them going like, yeah, no, dude, I can't watch that anymore. Uh -huh. you know? Or are just the whole, um, like how sh shows take off, right? Mm -hmm. Like game of Thrones or breaking bad. Like those are older shows. I can't think of anything new that's on that level that everybody's talking about, mm -hmm. but those are shows as Catholics. We shouldn't be watching. Right. You know, yeah. And to be like, no, nah, I just don't want to watch that. Like, dude, it's so good. Like, I'm sure it's probably good, but, you know, I just, uh, I, I can't watch it. Well, why not? I'm like, well, it just, it strikes <clears throat> firmly against my faith. Right. You know, and to say something like that, people are going to look at you weird. Yeah. You know, like, you haven't watched Breaking Bad. Mm -hmm. And, okay, for everyone, I've watched both of those shows and I've seen every episode mm -hmm. of both. But... I'm saying now, like the, I start thinking that way and, mm -hmm. and I'll watch something and be like, yeah, I should turn this off. Right. Yeah. Um, you had like this sensitivity to like really how malleable we are. Yeah. Yeah. I had that experience. I can... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I had that experience recently with like, I went on a nostalgia kick. My wife and I were like listening to a bunch of the pop punk we used to listen to like from yes. like, the nineties and two thousands. And we were watching music videos and I was like, I can't believe my parents let me listen to this stuff. Cause like you listen to the lyrics and it's all about, it's like, it's like, I didn't realize that it was already that depraved back then, you know? And, and same thing. Like I love classic rock and same thing, like listening to it now, there's some, there's a lot of songs that I'm like, dude, this is like appalling. Yeah. Right. So I, that's all that to say, like, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've become, I've become very sensitive to that stuff in terms of like, it's searing to my, to my conscience now. And I think it's everybody <clears throat> has their own thing that they can <clears throat> handle and can't handle, right? Like mm -hmm. for me, it's more the sexual content stuff I got to stay away from. Mm -hmm. uh, like the violent stuff, if depending, like yeah. you know, there's a level where I'm like, that is just too much. Like I've never yeah. watched, uh, I've never watched, uh, what is that, the zombie TV show, um, Walking Dead. Walking it's Dead. excessive now. Yeah, I try yeah, to keep up with. The I've never bit. watched it's that. Bad. Like the first episode, I think he shoots a, a zombie kid. Yeah. In the first five minutes. And I was, I turned it off right after that. Yeah. But, um, but you know, there's some things where it's like, I'm not watching that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I, that's, that's going to be damaging to my soul to watch that. Right. And there's other things where I'm like, Oh, John wick. Like that's it. Like, it's I just cool. <laughs> right. You know, but, I, but there's other yeah. people that that might really bother too them much, yeah. to where it's gonna, it's gonna <clears> hurt <throat> them. And mm -hmm. I think uh, we, everybody has to come up with their own, you have to understand yourself and what, what you can handle and can't handle. But I think in general, we have like, I mean, really probably shouldn't be watching John wick, 
Um, mm-hmm. But we all have to have that inner dialogue and be countercultural. Mm-hmm. That's going to stick out to other people where it's like, yeah, I just, yeah, right. I don't want right. to watch that. But anyways, I know we're up on an hour and a half and, uh, but uh, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And, and, yeah. uh, and fitting in on a Saturday. Oh, dude, um, thanks for having me. We always have fun conversations. I feel like we could go for another four hours. If we, I do too. If we... <laughs> and I was, and I told my wife I was going to get a bunch of chores done. And I'm like, well, confessions at four. It's one o'clock for my time. Oh man, <laughs> yeah. Run. But um, what do you got going on? What, what are you? Uh, what are you up to? Oh, let's see. I, I I need to do some more content. Um, I have a couple ideas. No firm dates on them. I'm gonna try to to go out to Denver if I can soon. That's just a couple hours from me and and do some interviews out there. Uh, I should send some emails off today and start planning that. But big thing this summer is I'm going to the Eucharistic Congress. So I'll be doing some some interviews and stuff and some coverage there. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. And I'm going to try to do some content on the way to that. But I don't know. Yeah, Where's that at this year? Uh, it's, it's Indianapolis. So, okay. yeah. Um, but, yeah, we'll be going to that. And I'll, I'm going to try and set up some interviews. So, uh that's kind of far out but in the meantime yeah nothing nothing huge planned i have a couple episodes i want to do on like uh like dating as a catholic because i have some single friends and stuff that we'll Mm -hmm. do interviews with but nothing firm so that's not helpful but (laughs) that's what's going on with me (laughs) well all your content is great so i'll definitely have the links below and, and everybody go check out his channel um and uh yeah you should do some stuff on rome because i know you just went to rome oh yeah we keep meaning to do that i have all the photos and stuff almost edited so i need to just maybe i'll do that after this because i have some time yeah and yeah we should do an episode on that it was so fun yeah yeah uh, i wouldn't i i forgot to ask you about that before we started recording because i wanted to hear all about it oh but... yeah yeah we'll have to do an episode for sure but so. Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Drew. And for having uh, me. and everyone, please like, share, and subscribe. Go check out Drew the Catholic. Uh, links below, and we'll talk to y'all later.